The lips of our dog, or the labia oris, is divided into the superior and inferior. The inferior is the lower part right here, the superior is the upper part. Um, the vestibule is this region that's sort of right here, outside of the teeth, against the cheek. Um, the cheek, also known as the buic high, is like this area right here, and it forms the lateral wall of the vestibule. And the nose is the rostral region right here. The platysma has been removed, but it should be right here. And it's the cutaneous muscle that passes from the dorsal medial raphe of the neck to the angle of the mouth, where it radiates into the orbicular oris in the lips. It is the most superficial muscle, covering the ventralaris surface of the face. The orbicularis oris and the buccinator muscles lie parallel around the edge of the mouth. Um, and they're difficult to distinguish from one another, but the orbicular oris lies more superficial and the buccinator muscles lie deep. Um, so the buccinator oris lies near the free board of the lips and extends from one lip to the other around the angle of the mouth. The fibers of each side end at the median plane in the incisor region of both jaws. Uh, the buccinator muscle is a thin, wide muscle that forms the foundation of the cheek. It attaches to the alveolar margins of the mandible and maxilla and the adjacent buccal mucosa. It can be found between the rasha board of master muscle and the orbicular oris. The levator nasal labialis is a flat muscle lying beneath the skin on the lateral surface of the maxillary bone. It rises from the maxillary bone and curses nostril ventrally and attaches to the edge of the superior lip on the nares, the external opening of each half of the nasal cavity. It dilates the nostril and raises the superior lip. All right, here we're looking at the uh, rostral or regular muscles, which um, you can see them here. They're flapping there. They hold the, uh, the ears um, rostrally, and um, they include those muscles that lie on the forehead, as we're seeing here, um, caudal to the orbit, and converge towards the auricular cartilage. And then here, more caudally, uh, behind the ear, um, you can't really see them too distinctly. But um, under uh, under this fascia here, you have your um, caudal auricular muscles, which are going to run towards your dorsal area in this way. Um, and then lastly, we have um, the scutiform cartilage, which we can see right here. We removed it from our uh, left side on accident, but you can see it here on the right. And that's a, just a small boot-shaped cartilaginous, cartilaginous plate located in the muscles rostral and medial to the external ear. All right, now we're looking at the structures that make up the eyelids here. Um, so you have your superior palpebrae, or palpebrae, which is um, just like the upper eyelid, and then your inferior palpebrae is the lower eyelid. Um, the palpebral fissure is actually just it's just the opening um, where you see the eye here. And then you have your medial and lateral comm commissures, which is um, just where the palpebrae join at either side. All right, now we are looking at the posterior or inner surface um, of, your eye of the eyelids. And they are covered by a mucous membrane here, which is called the palpebral conjunctiva. Um, if you follow that down, here covering the sclera of the eye is your bulbar conjunctiva. And the reflection or the angle that, uh, that these two different conjunctivas make is called, your, is called the fornix, which is right here. And just the, like, the cavity or the potential cavity formed between these two is called your conjunctival sac. And it's bounded posteriorly by the bulbar and then anteriorly here by the uh, palpebral conjunctiva. Not the, uh, once again, the medial commissure, but um, as you can see here, there's a triangle prominence of like finely haired skin, and uh, that is called the lacrimal caruncle. Uh, the lacrimal punctum is, um, is it a little bit difficult to see in this dissection? We'll probably see it later, but uh, it's the um, beginning of the dorsal and ventral lacrimal ducts, or the tear ducts. And um, each is a small opening 
on the conjunctival margin of the lid a few millimeters from the medial commissure and uh, it's easier seen with the magnification but we will see it later once we dissect this further alright these next few uh, eyelid structures are going to be more that we can't actually see during this dissection so we'll just describe their location and what they do um, the first is the lacrimal gland which is located ventral to the zygomatic process of the frontal bone and it's going to secrete through many duct openings into the um, conjunctival sac right here which was just that cavity we talked about earlier um, from there that that fluid is going to pass across the cornea of the eye and it's going to be collected by the lacrimal ducts of each lid um, and then we'll pass to the lacrimal sac and finally the nasal lacrimal duct to the ventral nasal meatus um, ventral nasal meatus of the rostral part of each half of the nasal cavity all right, we are now looking at the third eyelid, or the plica semilunaris, um, which is a concave fold uh, here that you can see. It's uh, made out of this uh, palpebra conjunctiva and also cartilage. And it protrudes from the medial angle of the eye, um, extends ventrally into the orbit, and it's surrounded by like, a body of fat and glandular tissue which is known as the superficial gland of the third eyelid. Alright, now we're going to talk about a few of the several muscles that make up um, the eyelids or that are associated with the eyelids. The first one being the orbicularis oculi which you can kind of see some of the fibers here and here a little bit but it's actually going to surround the entire eye. Um, or, and, it's, and it's partly um, made up of the eyelids and it's, it's attached medially to the medial palpebral ligament and its fibers eventually blend in with the fibers of the retractor anguli oculi lateralis so laterally it blends in to this muscle here which as you, as you can see that's more lateral and it's called the retractor anguli oculi lateralis Finally, we have the levator palpebri superioris, which is um, deep to these muscles. Uh, we'll see it when we dissect the muscles of the eyeball itself. But it, um, its, its function is to elevate the superior eyelid. All right, now we are looking at the salivary glands. The first one is the mandibular salivary gland, which is right here, this big guy. Um, it lies on the lateral side of the head, as you can see, and between, it's between the maxillary and lingual facial veins. Um, and it's covered by a thick capsule that also includes the caudal part of the sublingual gland here. Um, and then next, we are going to look at the parotid salivary gland, which is just this huge mass right here. It's kind of hard to distinguish, but it lies just beneath the ear there. And from the parotid salivary gland you have the parotid duct which is formed by two or three converging radicals which unite and leave the rostral border of the gland so it's just well, I run it down right here the, side of the lateral side of the face there That's good. all right and the last salivary gland is the zygomatic salivary gland which is going to eventually be um, dissected with the eyeball but in general, it's located medial to the zygomatic bone between the eyeball and the pterytoid muscle. All right, uh, now we're looking at the external ear. And besides the one small annular cartilage, which is deep to this and we can't see right now, but it uh, lies, lies uh, just superficial to the temporal bone, which, you know, like I said, is the annular cartilage. Um, the rest. Uh, the external ear consists of a single auricular cartilage which basically just makes up your whole like ear lobe um, and it's rolled into a tube ventral medially as you can see here and that's going to be called your external acoustic meatus basically just the ear canal itself um, and as you can see like I said it's uh, you know the auricular cartilage is funnel shaped here to make that uh, acoustic meatus up um, and then here, the actual flap of the ear is just referred to as, as the helix. Um, it's a slightly folded uh, 
medial and lateral margin of the auricular cartilage. And then finally, we have the tragus, which you can see right here, I'm picking it up. We actually made a little slit in it there just to help us identify it. Um, but the tragus um, is uh, the rostral boundary of the initial part of the ear canal is formed by thick. So it's a thick quadru quadrangular plate of the auricular cartilage. Okay, so the lateral portion of the helix is uh, indented proximally by an incisure. And at that point, uh, we can't actually see it because it's been removed here. Um, it's uh, more rostral to what we have left of the ear. Um, but it is the marginal cutaneous sac, um, which is just you know, a pouch of skin, basically. Um, and then lastly, for the external ear, we have the tympanic membrane, which we also can't see, but it's um, the external acoustic meatus or the ear canal. Eventually, deep dress or eventually enters into the tympanic membrane, which is more of an internal structure of the ear. And then finally, the annular cartilage, which I talked about earlier, but it's um, it's adjacent to the skull. It's deep to this um, to the auricular cartilage, which makes up the rest of the external ear. Okay, so we are looking at the oral cavity of the mouth. It is divided into the vestibule, which happens to be the region um, outside the teeth and the gums, and but inside the lips and the cheeks, and the oral cavity proper, which is bound dorsally by the hard palate and the small part of the adjacent soft palate. Um, in the dish, so then we go outside, where in the parotid duct is this opening, which is through the cheek on a small papilla located outside the vestibule. Um, in the caudal end of the upper fourth premolar or shearing tooth, the ducts of the zygomatic gland open into the vestibule, which would be over here, lateral to the last upper molar tooth, so way back there. The palatoglossal arc, on the other hand, can, is better seen on this dog, and that happens to be right here, where it is the beginning of the tongue, where it's the um, which extends from the body of the tongue to the beginning of the soft palate, and it's known as the palatoglossal arc. The tongue is divided into three parts. The caudal third is known as the root. The body, which is the second uh, portion, is a long, slender, rostral part of the tongue. And the free extremity over here, so it's not attached, is known as the apex. So there are five types of papilla. The first one is a filiform papilla, which are found predominantly on the body, so here on the apex of the tongue. They are arranged in rows like shingles, with their multiple pointed tips directed caudally. At the root of the tongue, the filiform papilla are replaced by the conical papilla, and they are have a, only one pointed tip, so you can kind of see that they're very, very pointed. And here in this region, you have the fungiform papilla which have a smooth rounded surface and are fewer in number in our in our tongue specifically they are they're lighter in color in comparison to the filiform papilla okay the foliate papilla are for, look found on the lateral margins of the root of the tongue rostral to the palatoglossal arc they are leaf like but appear as a row of parallel grooves in the fixed specimen so they would be over here and then the valley papilla so there's one big one right here and it's located at the junction of the body and root of the tongue. They are four to six in the dog and are arranged in the form of a V with the apex directed caudally. They are larger than the others, have a circular surface, and are surrounded by a sulcus. They, there are taste buds on phthalate, foliate, and fungiform papilla. The lingual frenulum is where the tongue is attached rostrally to the floor of the oral cavity by a ventral median fold of mucosa. Uh, what's left of the sublingual caruncle is right here which is uh, the sort of like edge extending caudally um, right here. And it's the edge of the sublingual fold, which is the whole thing overall. Um, then we have two ducts. They're sort of side by side right here, and so they're indistinguishable. They're the mandibular duct and the major sublingual duct. The parotid duct, once again, opens into the vestibule on a small papilla at the level of the caudal margin of the fourth upper premolar. Um, the ducts of the zygomatic salivary gland opens into vegetable near the last molar, just caudal to the parotid duct. The incisive papilla is right here, just caudal to the central incisor teeth. 
Um, and you also see from the small opening on the side of it is the incisive duct. Um, yeah. The vomoro nasal organ can't be seen based on how we've made this cross section, uh, but it would be extending caudally from the incisive duct close to the entrance into the nasal cavity. And this structure is tubular, about two centimeters long, and lies at the base of the nasal septum, dorsal to the hard palate, and it's an olfactory receptor of sexual stimuli. The oropharynx is this region right here, from the platoglossal arches all the way to the base of the epiglottis, and also um, the base of the tongue right here, and the soft palate. Uh, the palatine tonsil, better seeing this dog because it's still remaining, uh, is this right here. Uh, it is elongated caudal to the palatoglossal arches, and it's partially covered by this semilunar fold right here. The nasal septum divides the nasal cavity into its left and right halves. So luckily, we cut it so that the nasal septum is very visible right here. And the opening of the nasal lacrimal duct is actually it can be seen right there. The little hole um, it extends uh, I'm sorry, it's on the ventral aspect of the alar fold. The nasal pharynx is this cavity right here that extends from the conchni coani to the junction of the palatopharyngeal arches. And these are the arches right here, the platopharyngeal arches. Uh, we also have um, the platopharyngeus muscles that I attempted to expose right here. We can see the fibers, they're all jumbled up now. And they go all the way to the soft palate. Uh, we also have something called the auditory tube um, that we can see right here. It's within like this slit um, on the lateral wall of the nares of pharynx dorsal to the middle of the soft palate, right here in this auditory tube. The laryngopharynx, seen sort of here and here, uh, around the esophagus ex um, and dorsal of the larynx, extends from the platopharyngeal arches to the beginning of the esophagus. Uh, the esophagus begins at an annular constriction at this ridge right here. Um, at the level of the cricoid cartilage, known as the pharyngeosophageal, pharyngoesophageal lymen. This right here sort of makes like a ring. Or these folds are kind of thicker. Uh, the next set of muscles, the pharyngeal muscles, are very difficult to isolate, so I'm just going to describe more of the general region and some of the function. Uh, now, they all are aiding directly in the swallowing, um, so they'd all be in this general area right here. So we're going to start with the cricopharyngeus, which arises from the lateral surface of the coracoid cartilage, um, and its fibers are inserted on the median dorsal raphae of the laryngopharynx. Caudally, its fibers blend in with the esophagus here. Next is the thyropharyngeus, which arises from the lateral side of the thyroid lamina. It is inserted on the median dorsal raphi of the pharynx. This muscle is, the rost is rostral to the cricopharyngeus and caudal to the hypopharyngeus. Uh, the hypopharyngeus is in two parts as it arises from the lateral surface of the thyroid bone and the keratohyoid bone. Uh, the origin was previously transected, but the fibers of both parts form a muscle plate that passes dorsally over the larynx and pharynx to be inserted on the median dorsal raphae of the pharynx with its fellow from the opposite side. These pharyngeal muscles are all innervated by the pharyngeal branches of the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. The palatopharyngeus passes from the soft palate here into the lateral and dorsal wall of the pharynx. Its border is in the platopharyngeal arch. Uh, the pterygopharyngeus, pterygopharyngeus arises from the pterygoid bone and passes caudally and is inserted into the dorsal wall of the pharynx. These muscles constrict and shorten the pharynx. 
The stylopharyngeus arises from the styloid bone that we sort of back here and passes caudal laterally deep to the hypopharyngeus and the thyropharyngeus muscles to be inserted in the dorsolateral wall of the pharynx. It acts to dilate the pharynx. The levator veli palatini arises from the tympatic part of the temporal bone and passes ventrally to enter the soft palate caudal to the pterygoid bone. It raises the caudal end of the soft palate. Lastly, the tensor veli palatini arises mainly from the cartilaginous walls of the auditory tube, um, auditory tube members in this area right here, and is inserted on the pterygoid bone immediately on the soft palate. The epiglottic cartilage lies at the entrance to the larynx. Its lingual surface is attached to the basi hyoid bone and faces the oropharynx. The apex lies just dorsal to the edge of the soft palate. The lateral margin is attached by mucosa to the cuneiform process of the arytenoid to form the air epiglottic fold. So those are the two bumps there. Um, caudally, the, epi the epiglottis attaches to the body of the thyroid cartilage, which happens to be right there. It's better seen on the bottom. It forms a deep trough, which is open dorsally. The rostral and uh, caudal cornu are more easily felt rather than seen on this dog. The rostral cornu articulates with the thyrohyoid bone, while the caudal cornu articulates with the caudal aspect of the cricoid cartilage. Ventrally, the caudal border is notched by a median caudal thyroid incisure, which would be around there, while the cricoid lig cricothyroid ligament, which is about there, uh, attaches the caudal border to the ventral arc of the cricoid cartilage. The cricoid cartilage forms a complete ring uh, that lies partially within the trough of the thyroid cartilage. It has a wide dorsal plate or lamina and a narrow ventral arc. So in the bottom. Uh, near the caudal border at the junction of the lamina and the arc, there's a lateral facet for, facet for articulation with the caudal cornu of the thyroid cartilage. On the cranial border of the lamina, there's a prominent pair of lateral facets. Um, for articulation with the arytenoid cartilages. The arytenoid cartilages um, are, paired of, are paired irregular in shape, so it's around there, and located in a sagittal plane. Each articulates, me, articulates medially with a facet on the rostral border of the cricoid cartilage. The vocal fold over here um, is attached between the process of the arytenoid and the midventral part of the thyroid cartilage. The vestibular fold, which is there, um, extends from the thyroid cartilage ventrally to the ventral portion of the cuneiform process and forms a rostral boundary of the laryngeal ventricle, which happens to be basically that hole there. Um, is a diverticulum of the laryngeal mucosa bounded laterally by the thyroid cartilage and medially by the arytenoid car car cartilage. The glottis consists of the vocal folds, the vocal processes of the arytenoid cartilages, and the rima glottidis, which is a narrow passage through the glottis. At this level, the size and shape of the air passage can be altered by muscular activity. The cricothyroid muscle lies ventral to the insertion of the sternothyroidus muscle and passes from the cricoid car cartilage to the thyroid lamina. It tenses the vocal fold indirectly by drawing the ventral parts of the cricoid and thyroid colleges together. The cricoarytenoideus dorsalis arises from the dorsal lateral surface of the cricoid cartilage and inserts on the muscular process on the lateral surface of the arytenoid cartilage. It rotates the arytenoid so that the vocal process moves laterally, opening the glottis. It is the only laryngeal muscle that functions primarily to open the glottis. The cricoarytenoideus lat lateralis is would be formed on the lateral aspect. Um, rises from the lateral surface of the cricoid cartilage and inserts on the arytenoid cartilage between uh, the cricoarytenoideus dorsalis and the vocalis. It acts to close the glottis by pulling the muscular process ventrally and moving the vocal process medially. The thyroid arytenoideus is the parent muscle that gives rise to the vocal musical muscle, <laughs> the vocalis muscle, medially and ventral, and the ventricularis muscle rostrally. It rises along the midline, the thyroid cartilage, uh, and inserts on the arytenoid cartilage. It functions to relax the vocal fold and to constrict the glottis. Uh, the vocalis 
is a medial division of the thyroid muscle. We can still see bits of it right here. Um, and it arises on the internal midline of thyroid cartilage and inserts on the vocal process of the arytenoid cartilage. Um, attached on its rostral border is the vocal ligament. Here. The styloglossus, <laughs> seen better here, uh, arises from the stylohyoid bone, which would be in this area right here, passes rostral ventrally, lateral to the palatine tonsil, and inserts into the middle of the tongue. It retracts and elevates the tongue. The hyoglossus, um, the ones where the fibers run parallel to the tongue right here, arises from the thyrohyoid and the basohyoid and passes into the root of the tongue right here. It lies medial to the styloglossus and retracts and depresses the tongue. And the genial glossus um, right here uh, arises from the intermandibular articulation and adjacent surface of the body of the mandible. It joins its fellow at the median plane and is bounded medially by the genio hyoideus and laterally by the hypoglossus. Its caudal fibers protrude the tongue, and its rostral one retracts the apex. Uh, it lies partly in the frenulum, and these muscles are all innervated by the hypoglossal nerve, or the cranial nerve number 12. All right, we are now looking at the hyoid muscles. Um, the first one we're going to look at is the sternohyoideus. Um, which from its origin on the sternum and first costal cartilage is fused to the deeper sterno uh, thyroidus. Um, and then dorsally to that is the right here is your thyroid hyoidus muscle which is a short muscle that lies dorsal as you can see to the sterno uh, hyoidus. Um, their function is and swallowing, um, lolling, lapping, and retching. All right, now we're looking at the mylohyoidus, which is running here, as you can see. Um, it spans the inner mandibular space um, and arises as a thin sheet of transverse fibers from the medial surface of the body here. And um, of the medial surface of the body, the mandible, excuse me, um, and it is inserted on its fellow muscle at the mid ventral rafe. Uh, if and it forms a sling, then it aids in the uh, support of the tongue, as you can see here. And uh, it's kind of hard to tell; um, they're not easily distinguished here, but because uh, both fibers run parallel to each other. But uh, just deep to the mylohyoideus is the geniohyoideus runs here. Um, it's uh, also a muscular strap that arises on the adjacent to adjacent to the intermandibular articulation and then like I said it parallels like its fibers run parallel um, as well here and um, it's innervated by the hypoglossal nerve and contraction of the uh, geniohyodes draws the hyoid apparatus and larynx rostrally. The temporalis muscle right here arises from the temporal fossa and inserts on the coronoid process of the mandible. Um, the next one is the masseter muscle, which arises from the zygomatic arches, that'd be right here, um, where its deep portion is intermingled with the fibers of the temporal muscle. It inserts in the me mesenteric fossa the ventral lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible and the angular process. Between the eyeball and the pterocoid muscles is the zygomatic salivary gland. Um, it's not seen here, it's hidden laterally by the zygomatic bone, but the gland opens into the vestibule by one of the main and several minor ducts lateral to the last superior molar tooth. The pterocoid muscles, medial and lateral, arise Start right here, arise from the pterygoid palatine fossa and insert on the medial surface and caudal margin of the ramus of the mandible and angular process, ventral to the interstitial and temporal muscle. The digastricus, seen here uh, just below the masseter, 
arises from the pericondylar process of the occipital bone and is inserted on the body of the mandible. A tendinous insertion crosses its belly and divides its rostral and caudal parts. It acts to open the jaws, and the rostral portion is innervated by the mandibular nerve, a branch of the trigeminal cranial nerve 5, whereas the caudal belly ventral receives the facial nerve, the cranial nerve 7 innervation.